Hey guys, so today we're going to be talking about estimating and applying discount rates. And I have been trying to get through this video. It is going to be really long and I keep on messing it up. So please bear with me. I will try to get it in one shot here. So the discount rate is an investor's desired rate of return, generally considered to be the investor's opportunity cost of capital. And so the key words to take away from that are the opportunity cost of capital. So essentially, you as an investor have multiple investment options. And so if you decide to go with option A, then there is an op opportunity cost that exists when you are rejecting option B, C, and D. And so the discount rate accounts for that opportunity cost. The most common discount rate used in finance and used in the discounted cash flow valuation is the weighted average cost of capital, which is the average cost of financing a company's debt and equity, the two main sources of capital. Now, when I refer to the discount rate throughout my videos and probably throughout my channel, I'm going to be referring to the weighted average cost of capital. So to calculate the WAC, the weighted average cost of capital, you multiply the cost of equity by the proportion of equity, the market value of that equity divided by the total uh, market value of capital, plus the after tax cost of debt times the proportion of debt relative to the total market value of capital. And so it's relatively simp simple to understand this formula. In the end, the weighted average cost of capital, the cost of capital, there are two, the cost of equity and the cost of debt. And you're calculating the weighted average dependent upon how much of the company is financed through equity and how much of it is financed through debt. Now, in this respective video, we're going to be focusing on the cost of equity. In a separate video, I've already talked about the cost of debt. In this one, it's going to be the cost of equity. Now, a cost of equity is a return a firm theoretically pays to its equity investors to compensate for the risk they undertake by investing their capital. Essentially, what that means is, again, we're talking about opportunity cost. You have multiple options, and not only are you gaining exposure to this company and are taking on an X amount of systematic risk, you are also foregoing other investment options and therefore the cost of equity accounts for that risk that is taken on by exposing yourself and investing your equity, your capital into this, this company. So the traditional formula to calculate the cost of equity is the capital asset pricing model. This is what usually students learn. And it is the risk-free rate plus the beta of that security times the market risk premium, which is the expected market return minus the risk-free rate. And Essentially, this video will state what I'm trying to say is that this is wrong. Like majority of the time at the beginning and intermediate levels of financial courses, this is sufficient to really capture the cost of equity. But investment bankers and equity research analysts, they go beyond this. There are several assumptions that are excluded from this formula. And so we're going to be looking at a more advanced formula to really account for those excluded assumptions. But before we be we move forward, I think it's important to understand the base formula, the existing formula. So the risk-free rate is the time value of money. The beta of that stock is the really a measure of systematic risk, and it is the reward for bearing systematic risk relative to the systematic risk of the market. And the uh, market risk premium, which is the difference between the expected market return and the risk-free rate, is the amount of systematic risk that is taken on. So essentially, this is the base a return that any investor can get if they invest in a risk-free asset. And this is the amount of additional return that an investor will receive based on the amount of systematic risk that they take on. And so when you talk about the fundamental principle of uh, as you increase the amount of risk, you your potential returns can increase. This is that side of the formula, which reflects that as the system, the amount of systematic risk increases and your beta, your beta measure will reflect the amount of reward that you will receive based on that respective equity. Now, the more advanced formula accounts for three other premiums, the size risk premium, the country risk premium, and the con company specific risk premium. So throughout this video, we're going to be working through each of these ris three risk premiums, and really beginning to understand that we need to make additional assumptions in order to fully value the cost of equity. Okay, so the size risk premium is the key element in the buildup model, which we'll talk about later, but also in the capital asset pricing model. Generally, the smaller the company, the riskier it is, and the higher the risk pre the size risk premium is. So that's basic to understand. Say, for example, you're considering two, two companies. One has one store, and the other has 30 stores. In the end, the, one, the first business with only one store is much more exposed to the cyclicality of the economy, and therefore has a higher risk premium because of its smaller size. Whereas the second one, because it has diversified revenues and diversified locations, it is much more protected and therefore has a lower uh, size risk premium. 
And although there can be separate in-depth analysis, which can be done to calculate the size risk premium, the Ibbotson SBBI yearbook provides a great benchmark for many analysts in order to provide consistency. And a side note, and I really want to stress this, one of the big failings in finance at the moment is that a lot of analysts will try to go in depth and they'll do their own research and there's a lack of consistency in the way they do it. Now, I will be providing you a lot of benchmarks for each of these premiums in order to really provide consistency when you're not only calculating one company, but several companies and calculating the risk premium for those respective companies. So there needs to be consistency. You can't just pull numbers out of the air and say that for this company is going to be 8% and for that company is going to be 10%. It w that doesn't make sense. There needs to be some consistency backed, of course, by fundamental data that makes sense. So for the Sizer's premium, the Ibbotson SBBI yearbook provides a great benchmark. And so essentially what they have done is, and I've provided a link in the description for you to go to the database, but they've broken down the market cap of a company into 10 deciles. The top decile looks at companies between $17 billion and $626 billion. And that size risk premium is negative 0.37%. So you actually see that you're taking away from the risk premium because it's so big. Whereas the bottom level, the 10th decile, looks at companies between a market cap of $1 million and $253 million. And that risk premium is quite high at 6%. So they, and so Ibbotson has provided a great benchmark. It provides a lot of consistency. And I recommend that you, know, you as an entry analyst or you as maybe preparing for your investment banking interview should re reference this benchmark as your proxy for calculating the size risk premium. Now, the country risk premium is the additional risk associated with investing in an international company rather than the domestic market. So say, for example, you're a U.S. investor and you are considering investing in Iran. The fund, the Basic KPM model does not account for that country risk premium. In the end, if that company is either headquartered in Iran or gets a, a ma major part of its revenues from that country, there are additional risks, whether it's political instability, a volatility in exchange rates, or economic turmoil, which threaten the consistency of those cash flows and really the the overall value of those cash flows. So by adding the country risk premium, we really account for the geopolitical risks that in exist when investing in different companies. And because we are in global markets, geopolitical risks are much more prevalent now, especially for multinational companies where you really do have to calculate the company specific or the country risk premium. And so a great benchmark, a quick way to do it is to consider the Moody's uh, local currency sovereign rating. So looking at a rating of maybe AAA, the country risk premium would be only 0.2%. Uh, whereas if they, uh, the country had a uh, rating of D, then their uh, country uh, risk premium would be 10%. And so this is a great benchmark. I've actually provided another link in the description that leads you to a database that has calculated based on uh, credit default spreads and additional risk premiums, the country risk premiums. It's a big database provided by uh, New York University, and it's a, it's a great place for you if you really want to understand how we arrive at those uh, risk premiums for the CRP. So the final risk premium is the company-specific risk premium. And before we begin to really talk about this, I think it's important to understand how risk can be divided into. It can be divided into two segments, the systematic risk and unsystematic risk. Now, systematic risk is the risk that influences a large number of assets. It is essentially the market risk that exists, that, it expo is, that all companies are exposed to within that specific market. And the unsystematic risk is the risk that influences a single company or a small group of companies. So it's the company-specific risk. So say, for example, uh, let me let me provide an example. Uh, say, for example, you look at ABC Corp. It is a publicly traded company, and the general economy is underperforming. In the end, that would be considered systematic risk, whereas unsystematic risk would be, say, for example, one of their locations uh, caught fire, and you know the insurance premiums are not being paid out, and all of a sudden, you know the the company is losing a lot of money. That'd be considered unsystematic risk. So. That's it, market risk versus um, company-specific risk. And when we consider the KPM model, you will see that the beta measure only captures systematic risk. So when you think back to just this side of the formula, which is provided in all financial courses, well, where's the other side of the risk? There is an, a completely different segment, unsystematic risk, that is not accounted for. And so essentially, company-specific risk accounts for that unsystematic risk. Unfortunately, there is no standardized formula 
to calculate uh, company-specific risk. Usually, analysts, by their own judgment, will go and speak to management, and they will go on site and maybe review the mine or the loca company location. They'll look at the financial performance of the company, and they'll make all of these assumptions to come up with their number. And so really, when you're thinking about all of these risk premiums, this is the hardest one to calculate. Fortunately, Highline Global has provided a quick benchmark, and this is actually what I use for a lot of my valuations. Uh, when, when I'm producing uh, the cost of equity, I'm looking at this benchmark because it is a quick method to use and it just it, it provides a little bit of consistency. Again, when you're talking about that consistency, you want to have these benchmarks that when you're going from company to company to company, you're applying the same kind of lenses when you're va valuing these companies. Unfortunately, well, actually, let's let's talk about the benchmark first, and then I'll talk about the downsides of the benchmark. So essentially, what the benchmark does is it, f it finds seven proxies: so revenue growth, financial risk, operational risk, profitability, industry risk, economic risk, and customer concentration. And these seven considerations essentially equate and account for the unsystematic risk that exists for that respective company. Now, that's good. Like you usually find proxies when you're considering a company, and then you communicate that to investors that in the end, because of this respective statistic, the company is risky or it's not risky. Now, I have some pet peeves with this benchmark. First, I would say for maybe technology companies, if you're looking at operational risk, you can't really account for fixed costs because a lot of their costs don't really originate from fixed costs. They have a lot more tangible assets. And therefore, you know, it's not really a good proxy to use for maybe the newer companies, technology companies. In addition, for technology companies, why use the return on asset? Why not use return on equity? So there are these assumptions that be made. But the biggest one, in my opinion, is economic risk. And essentially, economic risk accounts for country-specific risk. We already have a premium for that. So essentially, you'd be double counting by accounting for country-specific risk in this benchmark as well. Fortunately enough, there are other other solutions to this problem you can kind of replace the proxies and use other ones but that comes back down to your judgment and your experience as an analyst for right now if you're considering big industrial companies that have been in the economy for 40 years then this benchmark is more than sufficient for the newer companies it's not as accurate and i would warn you not to use this benchmark so talking about it this is how it looks so essentially you're looking at the seven proxies that are here from left to right. And each row has an assigned rating. So say for example, a company has a 8% plus revenue growth. Then the assigned rating for this respective proxy would be a 0% risk premium. If the company has a financial risk of 10% to 20%, so 10 to 20% of, of the company's funded through debt, then it would have an assigned rating of 2%. And so you'd go through the entire list the entire um, table, associate the, uh, the assigned ratings, and then calculate the average rating to come up with the company specific risk premium. So I've done this just to kind of illustrate how it would work. So I randomly selected uh, tiles. So in this case, revenue growth will be that, 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 blah, 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 right? So the assigned rating for revenue growth would be 6% premium, uh, risk premium, the for financial risk would be three, for operational three, and then et cetera, et cetera. And so I've calculated all of these at the bottom. And then I just calculate the average of all seven of these variables, which is 3.86%. And so again, this is very simple. This is probably the quickest method to use when calculating the company specific risk premium. So returning back to our capital asset pricing model, essentially looking beyond the traditional textbook definition, which is this, we are adding the size risk premium, the country risk premium, and the company specific risk premium. A key assumption, which I excluded from this, and I'll make a separate video on this, is the beta of that asset. Now, lazy students and what most undergraduate students do is they go to Google Finance and they go to the beta value there on the page and they just take that and they put it into the capital asset pricing model. That's okay. That's not really right. It's okay, like it's not it's not wrong, but it doesn't really provide a lot of accuracy in your analysis. For investment bankers or equity research analysts, what they do is they actually take the unlevered industry median and then they relever it by applying the debt to equity ratio of that respective company to uh, find the beta value. I'll provide a separate video on that, so be sure to check that one out later. Now, another method, and which I talked about earlier on, was the build-up approach. And essentially, the key difference between the build-up approach and the KPM model is the industry risk premium. So instead of accounting for a systematic risk through the beta variable, we are adding the industry risk premium to account for that systematic risk. 
So the key differences between the KPM and the buildup model is that instead of multiplying the beta of the asset by the market risk premium, analysts just add the expected market return to the industry risk premium. And in addition, you are not calculating the market risk premium, so you're not subtracting the risk-free rate from the market uh, expected market return because systematic risk is captured through the industry risk premium. So instead of multiplying the uh, industry risk premium, uh, or instead of multiplying the market risk premium times the beta, uh, the beta of that respective asset, you're just adding the industry risk premium. So the industry risk premium is the amount by which investors expect the future return of the industry to exceed that of the market as a whole. So industry risk in the KPM is captured through the beta measure, as I said. However, when using the buildup method, it must be added through a risk premium. Ibbotson, thankfully enough, has provided another quick benchmark that can be used. So not only have they provided a size risk premium benchmark, but they've provided an industry risk premium benchmark. And so they actually publish uh, research or these these numbers for about over 300 industries. And so they've classified each of these industries using a SIC code, a standardized, uh, a standard industrial classification code. And so you can kind of find these numbers and then say, okay, if this, uh, if this industry has a SIC code of 263, you go to their, their database, which I'll, again, I'll provide the link in the description, and then you can find the industry risk premium for that respective year. So it's again, great consistency. Thank you, Ibbotson, for that. So to calculate the industry risk premium and the way Ibbotson actually calculates it is they multiply the, they find the risk index for the industry, which is essentially the beta of that industry. And they multiply the equity risk premium by that uh, risk index and then take away the equity risk premium. And so it's a relatively simple formula to understand. And so when you think about it, if RI is greater than one, then RIP, the industry risk premium will be positive because in the end, equity risk premium and equity risk premium are the same. So if, if this is greater than one, then this result will be greater than this result and therefore will be positive. If it's less than one, then this will be less than that one and it will be negative. And if it's equal, then it's zero. All right, so that's relatively simple to understand and that's kind of a quick mind trick to remember when you are calculating the industry risk premium. So when talking about the industry risk premium, actually many of the times it is negative. And so remember, we talked that if the... Uh, the risk index is less than one, then the industry risk premium would be negative. So therefore, for a lot of the 300, 300 plus industries, the risk index is actually uh, uh, smaller than one, and therefore uh, the industry risk premium is negative. So to calculate the industry, uh, the risk index for the industry, analysts use the full information approach. That's a fancy term to essentially say that you are finding all of the companies, the the companies in that industry. So every single one, whether they are a pure play or they are selling five, ten percent of their sales to that industry. So every single participant in that industry, which can take a while, but thankfully enough, we have Bloomberg. And then you calculate the median or average um, beta of that industry to then find your uh, risk index. So that's the the simple way of explaining this. So let's let's consider an example. So if we were to look at the household appliance industry has a SIC code, a standard industrialized code uh, of 363. Oh, these would be all of the players in the industry. And so you can see the top half over here would be the considered the pure play members. So they have, you know, the percentage of their overall sales to the industry would be between 100 and kind of above 90%, whereas the other ones would be much lower. And so you can see here, uh, Smith Corp would only sells about or only 30% of their sales goes to that industry, right? And so we let's let's kind of go through these columns. Essentially, this is the sales to that industry. This is the total sales. And so this percentage is the amount of sales that account for total sales. So the sales to the industry relative to the amount total sales of that of company. And so you'll see that some are 100% while others are maybe 3.5% or 4.6%. But this is the most important column. Essentially, by summing up all of these, you are getting 100% of industry sales. So it's important to account for all players in the industry. If this does not add up to 100%, then you have not accounted for everyone. And therefore, your full information analysis would be wrong. So once you've accounted for everything uh, for all players in the industry, the, the percentage of sales to the industry would be 100%. And actually, I want to make a key observation here, just to kind of reflect how how important it is to decide for your decision between deciding on the pure play analysis and the full information member. So let's look, look at uh, General Electric. So General Electric, their percentage of sales that is earned from that industry, so from the 366, 363 industry, is about 
uh, would be five million uh, out of 127 million for that respective quarter. So it actually makes only about 4.6 percent of their overall sales. So it's not a really important business to them. However, when looking at the overall impact to the re to to the industry, you'll see that they actually their sales make up 22 percent of the industry. So if you were to go only with the pure play players and choose the um, the beta of only these companies, then you'd be excluding the second biggest er earner to the industry. So by including the full information members, you're accounting for the all uh, the full industry. And so that's essentially the, the key decision in the full information analysis. Do you choose only the pure play players or the full information players? And so you have the average beta for the pure play players to be at 1.06 and for the full information players to be at 1.04. In my opinion, I would go with the full information all the time. In the end, it does account for the full industry, and you want to have full transparency and consistency from that. So always go for that. And so say, for example, we have an equity risk premium of 7.46%. We put in our in risk index, our beta for the industry of 1.04, multiply it by that, and our industry risk premium would be 0.298%. That is how we calculate the industry risk premium. You then add that back into your your uh, build up approach uh, formula, and then you can get your cost of equity. So that's the only thing. Other than that, so here once again a side to side comparison of each of the two models. The only re real difference in variables is this over here. So here we're only calculating the systematic risk through the beta measure, whereas here we're calculating systematic risk through the um, industry risk premium. And my final comment on this would be. Theoretically, the build-up model and the KPM model, if you were a very in-depth analyst, you would use calculate both of these costs of equities, and both of them would have to equal the same number. If they don't, then technically you are not applying the same methodology, and you are not providing consistency in your analysis. But rarely is that the case because it's really difficult to be accurate and accurately capture the industry risk premium or the size risk premium. Because again, looking at the Ibbotson benchmark, you only have 10 deciles, but there are companies that range from 1 million to $626 billion. Like it's really difficult to, again, to provide consistency and accuracy at the same time. So th you, there is a trade-off in the end. But that would be my final uh, comment on that. From a theoretical perspective, the KPM model and the build-up method would have to produce the same ca uh, cost of equity. That's rarely ever the case. Other than that, I think that's really it, guys. Thankfully enough, I made it to the video. Oh my gosh, this is the fourth time I've been trying this, but good. Uh, so hopefully you guys liked it. If you guys don't, understand something I was trying to explain, or if you, you guys want a little bit more content and information, please do comment uh, on the video below. I'll be sure to get back to you. If you guys liked the video or it, you found it helpful, please, please, please like the video. Please subscribe to my channel. I'll be trying to do as many videos as I can. I'm trying to balance work and school right now, but other than that, I'll be trying to provide more videos for you guys. So you guys take care. Good luck with interviews and with school and have a nice day, guys. See ya.